This podcast is sponsored by Ipono Maui and ED Care. Ipono Maui is led by internationally renowned expert on eating disorders, Dr. Anita Johnston. Located in a home-like oceanfront facility in beautiful Maui, Hawaii, Ipono offers residential, partial hospitalization, and intensive outpatient treatment for eating disorders. Visit iponomaui.com, spelled A-I-P-O-N-O-M-A-U-I, to learn more. ED Care has provided PHP, IOP, and outpatient treatment for all genders 18 and over since 2001. CAMSA, which stands for Connection, Acceptance, Mindfulness, Sense of Self, and Action, is ED Care's mindfulness-based treatment approach and is incorporated into each individualized treatment plan. Facilities are located in Denver, Colorado Springs, and Kansas City and all treatment is supported by master's level clinicians or higher. ED Care offers four specialty tracks for binge eating disorder, elite athletes, substance use, and trauma. And the Connections House, an affordable, supportive housing component, adds an extra layer of supervised support. Visit eatingdisorder.care or call 866-771-0861. Welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast with me, Dr. Janine Anderson. Heads up, this show may contain adult language and may mention specific foods. If you find either of those to be too triggering, I trust you to take care of yourself and do what you need to do. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Levine. Michael P. Levine, PhD, is an emeritus professor of psychology at Kenyon College in Ohio, where he taught for 33 years from 1979 to 2012. In the field of eating disorders, his commitment to research, writing, and activism focuses on the intersection between sociocultural risk factors, prevention, community psychology, and developmental psychology. He has authored two books and three prevention curriculum guides, and he has co-edited three books on prevention. In August 2015, as a co-editor with his longtime collaborator and colleague, Dr. Linda Smolak, He published a two-volume Handbook of Eating Disorders published by Wiley and Sons Publishing. He and Dr. Smolak are currently working on a second updated edition of their 2006 book, The Prevention of Eating Problems and Eating Disorders. In addition, he has authored or co-authored approximately 110 articles and book chapters, and he has presented his work throughout the United States as well as Canada, England, Spain, and Australia. He is a member of the advisory councils of the National Eating Disorders Association, NIDA, the Center for Study of Anorexia and Bulimia, CSAB, in New York, and the Center for Balanced Living, CBL, in Columbus, Ohio, and Montanito and Affiliates Eating Disorder Treatment Centers. Dr. Levine is a fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders which has awarded him their Meehan Hartley Award for Leadership in Public Awareness and Advocacy in 2006 and their Research Practice Partnership Award in 2008. Dr. Levine is also a member of the Founders Council of the National Eating Disorders Association, which awarded him the Lori Irving Award for Excellence in Eating Disorder Prevention and Awareness in 2004 and the Nielsen Award for Lifetime Achievement in 2013. After living for 37 years in Mount Vernon, Ohio, with his wife, Dr. Mary A. Sudium, a retired Kenyan religious studies and women and gender studies professor, they moved to California in late June 2016 to live near UC Santa Barbara, where they both obtained all of their degrees. It is no understatement to say that Dr. Levine is truly one of the leaders in the field and is one of the most prolific eating disorder researchers. We are so honored to have him here today. Dr. Levine, thank you for being here. My pleasure. So your area of expertise is sociocultural factors and then also prevention of eating disorders. But first, just in case our audience doesn't know about your background, tell us a little bit about your background and and your career. 
Oh, well, I'll try to be uncharacteristically brief, uh, <laughs> as you know. Take your time. Uh, we have time. <laughs> perhaps one of the most interesting things about my background is that um, I have a PhD in experimental psychology. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not a treatment provider. Mm -hmm. uh, I also, to my knowledge, have no family members. I now have close friends due to my work who've been affected by eating disorders. But when I became involved in the field, not only did I not know anybody who had an eating disorder or, or at least openly had one, I didn't know anything about eating disorders. Mm -hmm. I was uh, a young professor and I was teaching abnormal psychology. And this was so long ago that uh, not only was there no section in the textbooks about eating disorders, the only mention of an eating disorder was a notation about anorexia nervosa as a rare and controversial disorder. And that was found in the last chapter of the textbooks I was using, the chapter that sometimes you never even got to. Mm -hmm. So I stumbled into the field as a volunteer, first for a domestic violence shelter in a tiny county in Ohio. And then through that work, I got involved with a local mental health association in Knox County, Ohio. And through a set of coincidences and over my protests, we ended up putting on the first Eating Disorders Awareness Week in the United States. This was oh. in the fall of 1983. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was an organization in Columbus, Ohio, called the Center for the Treatment of Eating Disorders, and it had a nonprofit educational, prevention-oriented advocacy point, portion called uh, the National Anorexic Aid Society. And the woman who was running that, her name is Amy Dennis, became and still is one of my mentors. And she was the one who really encouraged me to get involved in the prevention and education side of things. And that's how I stumbled into it. Mm -hmm. And through her, I met a lot of the people who really established the field of eating disorders as a field, people like, um, well, like Amy Dennis herself, but also people like Pauline Powers in Florida and Craig Johnson, who was then in Oklahoma, and Paul Garfinkel in Toronto and Jim Mitchell from Minnesota, now in North Dakota. I really was in on, in some ways, uh, or was on the periphery of the, the founding of eating disorders as a field. Mm -hmm. And so that was just, again, very fortunate. And, and the other fortunate thing that happened to me is that I was teaching at a small liberal arts college, Kenyon, in central Ohio. And there was another professor there who was a developmental psychologist who was working in the area of language and cognitive development, uh, studying um, some of the theories that emerged based on Piaget's early work. And she was looking for a new area, a new field to get involved with. And the two of us together in some ways stumbled into gender and body image and the cultural factors that affect body image and disordered eating. And I began to work in, in very close proximity with her. Uh, she, her office was about a foot from mine because it's a very small college. And, <laughs> um, we became very close friends and collaborators. And uh, she, fortunately for me, again, became one of my mentors and She's a genius. So I was lucky in that regard. And then we hired another young woman, Sarah Murren, in the late 80s, whose specialty was statistics and research methodology and gender. And the three of us began to work together and also independently, and sometimes they worked together. So I, I had a very fortunate experience, an unheard of experience, of teaching at a small liberal arts college with a total student body of less than 1,700. There were eight people in the psychology department toward the end of my career, wow. and three of us were doing work in the area of body image, gender, sociocultural factors, eating disorders. And these are people who really affected me as a scholar, but also as a man, as a person, as somebody who thought much more deeply about the ways that gender and the ways that culture and the ways that mass media have affected me as a person as well as affected how our cultures think about weight and shape and eating and control and a lot of the, the issues that arise in thinking about 
the causes of eating disorders and also in thinking about the nature of the eating disorders themselves. Right. You know, I was actually going to save this question to the end, but it feels like you've already kind of put like a really a natural segue in there. Certainly the field has been so fortunate to have all of your contributions. I mean, I can't overstate how important the work that you've done and your colleagues have done has been to our understanding of eating disorders. But on kind of a more personal note, you know, one of the things that is equally impressive to me, aside from your amazing prolific career, is that you're this wonderful person who's an amazing feminist male ally. And I was wondering what interested you in eating disorders and how that became something that you clearly care so deeply about, you know, having no background originally in this. Well, two points are really important. The first is I was raised as a fairly privileged white male in a pretty upscale uh, suburb of Los Angeles. And so I was not raised as a feminist, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. My father was very liberal and very compassionate and very progressive when it came to race, when it came to uh, social class, when it came to a number of things that were not popular topics in Claremont, California. Mm -hmm. But he was, and remained to the end, a chauvinist. Mm -hmm. He once wrote an article for the local newspaper in which he bemoaned the increasing feminization of our culture. Uh, I still have that. It remind me where I, yeah, where I come from. So I was not raised with any kind of enlightened attitude, to put it mildly. Secondly, it's important for people to note that I am still very much a work in progress, given how I was raised. I mean, aren't we all? Yeah. Uh, I told people that when I was growing up, I think you might have heard me say, when I was growing up, I would have given anything to have been Mickey Mantle, the Mm -hmm. legendary baseball player, who it turns out was also a legendary drinker and a legendary philanderer and an individual who left his family in the lurch in many, many ways and, and, pardon the expression, pissed away a fair amount of his talent and his opportunities, Mm -hmm. even though his statistics are mind-boggling. That's who I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so I was not raised that way, and I'm still much a work in progress. The other interesting thing is, is that my eye-opening experiences as a pro-feminist, and I like to think of myself as a feminist male, Mm -hmm. occurred before I got into the eating disorders field. Mm, Tell us about that. I had done my doctoral dissertation on type A behavior, coronary prone behavior, and learned helplessness. Uh, And somehow I managed to read hundreds, if not thousands of articles and chapters in books and managed to write a 300 page dissertation and managed to do research on type A behavior and, and coronary heart disease without ever considering gender. Wow. Even though, of course, those characteristics, the type A characteristics, have been part and parcel of American, in particular, European masculinity for several hundred years. I had not thought a whit about gender, nor did anyone ask me anything about gender throughout the process of my pre-doctoral oral exam, my doctoral oral exam, my job interviews, anything. I had not thought a whit about it wow. until my wife became one of the founding mothers of the domestic violence shelter in this tiny county in 1981. Mm-hmm. And one of the first things that, as you know, nonprofits like that do is they set up a speakers bureau. Mm-hmm. And one of the things they needed for the speakers bureau was a male to go out and talk to some of the male organizations and make more of an impact on them. The Lions Club, the Kiwanis, in those days, the Rotary, a number of the organizations in addition to um, some of the training they were getting ready to do for law enforcement. And so my wife volunteered me. <laughs> or voluntold you. That was, yes, <laughs> And that was, I have to remember that, that was the first time I had ever, A, spoken to the public about psychology, and B, the first time I had ever thought about gender in relation to problems 
significant problems, in this case domestic violence, and C, it was the first time I had really considered in great depth the ongoing confusions in our culture or cultures about what's normal, what's normative, what's abnormal. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it's quite, it was quite normative in my area to ask a rhetorical question of police officers, what's the difference between you beating up your next door neighbor's wife and you beating up your own wife? For them to answer, well, that's an easy one. My wife belongs to me. Wow. And then you begin to realize that this is, and nobody groans or rolls their eyes or nobody says anything. Right. Uh, except you're thinking, oh my God, where am I? What am I doing here? Am I ready for this? I began to realize that while this was normative, it was really disturbing and really upsetting and a part of the problem. Absolutely. Just as much as people saying, well, if she didn't like being beaten up, then she would leave. Wow. And I began to think much more clearly about the context here. Mm -hmm. What do you mean she would leave? She has no money of her own. She has nowhere to go. Nobody respects. I mean, and so on. You've heard this before. But somehow at age 32, 33, with a PhD behind my name and a lot of years of education, and coming from a highly educated family in a highly educated community, this had never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in some ways, I was prepared by that experience, hanging around with pro-feminist men, other pro-feminist men and feminist women in the context of trying to educate people about domestic violence and family violence. I was prepared to think more contextually prepared to think more in terms of gender, prepared to think more in terms of those distinctions between normal, normative, abnormal, unhealthy, when I began to study eating disorders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just kind of had that experience that had put you in that place where you were thinking a lot more in depth about these things. And thank goodness we had somebody like you who was interested well, and cared. You. And And I had those colleagues. Well, first of all, my wife, who's a medieval historian that uses feminist methodologies to study women's religious experience, mm -hmm. I had that at home and reading those things and discussing them. I also had my colleagues, I mentioned Sarah Mernon and Linda Smolak, mm -hmm. who were not only teaching the traditional psych courses, they were beginning to teach the introduction to psychology of women, uh, research methods in psychology of women they themselves were beginning to think deeply about these topics in relation to a number of topics in social and developmental and child psychology and, and beginning to apply those things to body image, to dieting, to eating disorders. So I just happened to be, if you will, in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And as the 80s rolled on, I began to acquire more colleagues and mentors uh, nationally and ultimately internationally, people like Margot Main, Beth McGilley, um, mm -hmm. and so on, people who were also thinking in those ways, Neva Piran from the University of Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, who's one of the world's foremost experts on prevention. These are people who were part of the second wave of feminism in the late 60s and early 70s. They were out in the streets. They were doing feminist-oriented research, and some of them were applying it to prevention. And so it's interesting how it works. I, I began to get the graduate education that I really wanted, undergraduate and graduate education that I really wanted and needed some, gosh, in some cases, some 10 years after I finished graduate school. <laughs> yep. I I bet there are a lot of therapists and psychologists out there listening, thinking, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, you know, after your long career where you've contributed a lot, I know this is a big question, but what are some of the sociocultural factors that our listeners should be aware of and how they relate to eating disorders? Like if we're trying to help our listeners or our clients take a bigger picture view and kind of zoom out and see what's happening in our culture or cultures with this, what are those socio cultural factors? Let me answer your question 
by saying, first of all, I like to start when I talk to people about this with the messages. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go to the sources of those messages. Sounds good. And this is a horrible way to phrase it, Janine, but having been to graduate school, you know how these essay questions sometimes look. It's fine. If you were going to build someone who was at risk for an eating disorder. Oh, I'm that person. It's cool. We've talked about this on the podcast. Yeah, just go, <laughs> yes. just lay it all out to, there. <laughs> if you were, yeah, if you were going to build someone right. who was at risk for an eating disorder, mm -hmm. what components would you like to instill in them? And it's no good saying, well, uh, genetic vulnerability, since we don't know what that vulnerability is. Mm -hmm. We have some general ideas. But if you were talking very specifically about eating disorders, not that you were going to build someone who was at risk for being depressed or at risk for having panic disorder with agoraphobia or at risk for substance abuse, but you were going to build a person who was at risk for uh, an eating disorder, what is it that you would wish to instill in them or which components would you want to make sure they had? I would argue that you would want them to do, to have the following things. You would want them to think of their own being, their own, you would want their identity to revolve around the importance of weight and shape and appearance. Mm -hmm. You would want them to have issues with control and management not only of weight and shape and appearance, but also of motives like hunger or motions like rage or anxiety. You would want them to have issues with the understanding of and the control of and the expression of fundamental aspects of being human. You would want them to not only be wrapped up with appearance and the importance of controlling appearance, you would want being slender or keeping your weight down to be of the utmost importance. And you would want them to think of fat as one of the dirtiest, most awful things that they can imagine. Mm -hmm. That is, you would want them to have a set of beliefs about the value of being slender, the widespread value, and the awfulness on so many levels of being fat, including you'd want them to believe that if one is fat, if one becomes fat, if one remains fat, that it's somehow that person's fault. Right. And that it says that they are less of a person than other people, mm -hmm. that they deserve whatever happens to them. Um, I think you would also want someone who is oriented toward the world, the social world in particular, as, as a, a means of determining whether what they're doing or feeling or how they're being in the world is, quote, good or bad. Right. That external kind want, of approval. You, that's right. You probably also want someone who um, is looking to simplify things, uh, not looking for a lot of ifs and, and buts. And in this situation, you do the, like you know, a lot of, of simplicity rather than complexity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're, if you're following me here, to me, these kinds of, you'd also want somebody whose self-esteem is unstable, whose belief in their own value and belief in their own, um, deservingness in the world, belief in their own value as a human being is, uh, unstable. That is, it can fall or fall even further. There's no limit to how far it can fall, depending on how one is doing in the world. So maybe, what, an, what, what? maybe an example of that, just to kind of clarify for people would be your self-esteem, you know, being unstable that if somebody criticizes your appearance, you just feel like garbage for that day about yourself. Yes. yes. And you have a lot of those kinds of um, uh, proclivities, tendencies that they talk about in cognitive behavior therapy. If you have four things that are going well in your day, but something goes not very well, that's what you focus on. I can't relate to that at all. <laughs> no, I mean, right. and a tendency to, uh, you know, uh, you just, you're, you're prepared for things to go bad. And then for when it does, it says 
something bad about you. Mm-hmm. And so you're sensitive to uh, those kinds of things. You may feel better when things are going better, but you may feel much worse when things are going bad. You don't have a solid foundation. Now, that's a general kind of factor, but that's part of one component I would build in. Mm -hmm. So where I'm going with all this is I'm trying to focus on what makes an eating disorder an eating disorder, not just what makes depression depression or what makes anxiety anxiety. We're not talking about risk factors or, or components of general psychopathology. We're talking about the specifics of what makes something an eating disorder. Right. So if you're following those messages there, on the one hand, you could think of those messages as the nervosa in the phrase anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Mm -hmm. You'd also want somebody too who didn't feel for whatever reasons uh, comfortable or even natural or normal in their own body. Yeah. You'd want somebody who looked at and at, who who looked at his or her own body as if they were looking at it from the outside, as if they were viewing it through a mirror, uh, not, not how it feels or how they're connected internally, but how it appears to others from the outside. You'd want somebody who really didn't focus on those internal feelings and internal sensations, but rather on external, as we said, external guides or external cues or messages. Mm -hmm. This, in my opinion, from the standpoint of psychopathology, you could think of the set of these things as part of, very much part of what constitutes the nervosa in the word anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Just tell our audience real quick what uh, nervosa means. Well, no, no. as you saw when I spoke, uh, no one quite knows what it means. Uh-huh. It's one of those words that gets thrown on there. To me, it means not only having to do with nervousness, but having to do with the type of concerns and preoccupations and anxieties that are fundamental to the eating disorders, mm-hmm. to the principal eating disorders, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, mm-hmm. um, and are often found in binge eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Um as you know, the word anorexia just means lack of appetite, and anorexia as a symptom, the lack of appetite, is found in many other disorders, including depression. Bulimia just means ox hunger or large hunger, and there are some neurological conditions in which you find bulimic behavior. When you put nervosa on it, you talk about the disorder, or if you will, the mental illness that we know as the eating disorder, anorexia mm-hmm. nervosa or bulimia nervosa. I'm saying, what does the nervosa mean? It means these components that I've just been talking about, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a fairly sophisticated opinion in this instance. Mm-hmm. Um, now, think for a moment. We're back to one of the points I made earlier, talking about my work with domestic violence. How many women and girls do you know in general, and not a few men probably, but how many girls and women do you know have those components? So many. The external orientation, orientation, the the drive for thinness, the fear of fat, the definition of self in terms of weight, shape, and appearance, the unstable self-esteem, the control issues we talked about, uh, not to mention some of the features of, you know, uh, histories of calorie-restrictive dieting or binge eating or use, even abuse of, of fasting diet pills, fat diets. This is not to say that all women and girls have an eating disorder, that's ridiculous. It is to say that there's a lot of confusion in our culture between what's supposedly normative, particularly for females growing up in our culture, and what's the foundation of a disorder. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm both really, really concerned about and also very interested in from the standpoint of prevention. Right. Where do those messages come from, Jimmy? That's the question. Well, tell us about that. Where do they come from? Well, to think about it, I mean, if you think about it for a moment, I think if your listeners consider, where do we get those messages? I do not believe that girls and women who are at much greater risk for almost all the eating disorders, much greater risk, I do not believe that they are born thinking this way. Mm -hmm. That it's 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 not just the biological perspective that can explain it, right? No. That's important, but... Yeah, it may become part and parcel of their biology insofar as the brain is related to our psychology. But these are learned attitudes, learned desires, learned anxieties, learned motives. 
they're they're socially and interpersonally and sometimes personally acquired. And so how do we learn these things and how, where do we get these messages and how are they reinforced and elaborated? And in our culture, one is hard pressed to find factors that don't contribute to these messages. Mm-hmm. Um, parents contribute to these messages. Siblings contribute to these messages. Peers at school contribute to these messages. Um, mass media of various sorts have been contributing to these messages for a long, long time. Um, social um, networking contributes to these messages. Um, athletics, in some instances, contribute to the messages. Physicians, psychologists, dietitians, um, even uh, clergy in some ways contribute to the messages. Mm. One of the things that makes this such a part of our culture is that it's, uh, there are so many sources that convey these messages, that connect the messages, that elaborate the messages, that extend the messages, that most people, I bet most of your listeners would be hard-pressed to take the following comment as a compliment. And suppose I said to you, Jeannie, suppose I hadn't seen you in a while, and I said to you, gosh, Jeannie, you look great. You've put on fat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure everybody listening yeah. is having a reaction to that. Like, that just doesn't yeah. make sense. And we're just so bathed in this anti-fat culture that, like you said, yeah. it's coming that message that we're being taught. We're not born with anti-fat bias. Um, is just coming at everybody from so many sources anymore that, like you said, it would be hard pressed to uh, escape that. Yes, and um, and yet we know, particularly when it comes to the maturation of girls into um, young women and eventually into mature women, that the accumulation and uh, arrangement, if you will, the accumulation of body fat is a key part of becoming a mature woman. Mm -hmm. And I like to ask my students and my audiences, and I like to ask myself now and then, how is it that we, and many of your listeners are of an age now where they're old enough that the culture is we, is us. Mm -hmm. We're teachers, we're psychologists, we're doctors, we're lawyers, we're grandparents, we're people who volunteer at our church or for scouts or for 4-H or the equestrian team and whatnot. This is us we're talking about. How is it that we have created a culture in which an essential component of the human body in general and the female body in particular is considered a dirty word? Mm -hmm. As I like to say, you've heard me say that. I mean, what the fat is going on? I know. That's the title of our Uh, episode today, What the Fat. (laughs) Yeah. And... um, (laughs) Uh, it sounds like a joke, but it's it's far from a joke. It's think about that. Oh, I I mean I think it's problematic on so many levels and in so many forms. I mean, from the the fact that we are prejudiced and biased against certain body shapes to the fact that we don't embrace fat as a tissue type, just like bone or muscle. It's just part of your body and has a really important function, especially like you said, for women down to the fact that people become afraid of fat, the substance that we cook with and that we need to ingest as well. I mean, our anti-fat bias, I feel like is pervasive and, um, I don't know if thorough would be the word, but it certainly, uh, has a lot of breadth. Yes, and the same thing to some, I mean, I'm not sure it's as strong, but the flip side of that, uh, if you thought of this as a a, a monster, a hydra, a multi-headed monster, um, where you try to cut off one head and something else sprouts up, uh, you know, the drive for thinness, uh, the definition of women in terms of their weight and shape, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the belief that as women age and get heavier or fatter, that they're somehow of less value right. than younger women, um, that there's something about a woman who takes up space in the world that's threatening. Um, there's a whole lot of prejudices that are deep-seated in our culture that I believe we can do something about. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that um, I tell my, my students and my audiences is that Part of being in my late 60s now and having grown up in the 50s 
and, and the 60s is I can remember a time when drunk driving was a legitimate topic of humor and eye rolling and winking and that there were comedians who made a pretty good living on television and on the stage um, being drunk or at least pretending to be drunk. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a time when domestic violence was a joke and was simply understood to be, uh, you know, one aspect of men's control of, of their women, of their, of their domestic property. Mm -hmm. I remember when um, the high school I went to had no varsity athletics for girls, none. I had PhDs teaching me during my senior year, but I had, there were no athletics for girls. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I'm sure, Janine, that if I had had the ovaries to stand up <laughs> and say something about it and complain, there would have been three things would have happened. The first, people would have thought I was joking. You know, I was being cynical or, or, or just, you know, deadpan humor. Right. And, when, and if I repeated it with urgency, I would have been called a word that uh, rhymes with bag and starts with F. Right. They would have emasculated you. Would, yes. If I would have persisted, they would have tried to further emasculate me by beating me up mm. and shunning me and so on. Because I was arguing that girls had a right to participate in varsity sports. Now, of course, if you went somewhere and someone told you that your daughter couldn't participate in varsity sports because we were concerned about uh, her reproductive health, uh, I mean, there'd be a lot. Right, it would be absurd. You would, you would, yeah, it would be either, you would think that person was joking. Right, right. Um, and so what I'm saying is, is that although there's a long way to go, and we saw that, if pardon my political opinion, in the, in the last election in the campaign, mm -hmm. there's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, our culture has changed dramatically with regard to women in politics, with regard to domestic violence, with regard to drunk driving, with regard to um, women in sports, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to women in science. There's a long way to go, but we've changed dramatically. I believe that your listeners and you and I and the people that we work with at our conferences and, and in our, our, our other work, that we can be participating, and we are, in, in the same type of dramatic changes when it comes to body image, to weight and shape concerns, to disordered eating, to uh, creating a culture right. that's much, much healthier for everybody. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I mean, I hope that People listen to this episode of the podcast and have some things to think about. If not, you know, feel a little a little shift inside of them that might be um, putting and, and them. And to know that if they're if they've been feeling that shift, because many people know. People say to me, "I want you to come in and tell the girls in our seventh grade class uh, what you know, because they're so ignorant." No, they're not. Right. <laughs> if it's one thing I've learned from Neva Piran and other feminists working in the prevention area, is that the girls if you will, and the boys, they know, the people on the ground in the circumstances, they know what's going on. Absolutely. They don't have to be told what's going on. They may feel silenced and ashamed and powerless to do much about it, but they're well aware of what's going on. What we need is for people to understand that there are an increasing number of us who are not going to take this anymore. Right. Who are, who are not going to stand for this in our own homes, in our psychological practices, in the small groups of friends that we maintain or the larger groups. We're going to talk about this in our synagogues and churches and mosques. We're going to teach about this in our classes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to examine the, the science of it, if you will. This is all, uh, it's political, yes. It's personal, you bet you. But it's also professional. Of course. The things I'm talking about are science, evidence-based contentions. No one's saying, you know, I think objectification of girls and women, you know, it could have some relationship to body image and disordered eating. It did for my sister. Nobody's arguing that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, we know it does. <laughs> of, yeah, there's a mountain of data pointing to the impact of sociocultural factors on two of the best documented risk factors for eating disorders. Body dissatisfaction is one of them, and the other one is uh, internalization of the thin ideal. Mm -hmm. 
Now, these don't explain, as your listeners know, they don't explain all instances of eating disorders. Right. I know there are people who say, my daughter has an eating disorder, and she's not dissatisfied with her body, and she doesn't give a damn about the thing. Like, this happens. Mm-hmm. But looking across the hundreds and thousands of millions of people affected by eating disorders, there is evidence that two well-demonstrated risk factors are body dissatisfaction and internalization of the thin ideal. The third one is negative affect or the old neuroticism, uh, the old notion that you have a tendency to feel anxious and depressed and irritated and Mm -hmm. a tendency to overreact to stress and overreact to setbacks the way you were talking about. It's hard to believe that growing up in a culture that, that thinks less of you and sees your body as an object and that puts you at risk for sexual exploitation, it's not harassment and abuse and so forth. It's hard to believe that that doesn't contribute in any way to negative affect. Yeah, of course. I mean, how could you not be anxious and not feel like your self-esteem was a little bit more malleable or vulnerable um, given when you're inundated with tons of messages about how your body is not okay? Yes, and, and that your body is a public thing that, and, and people can whistle at it or try to touch it or comment on it or, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, if, if they think you've had enough to drink to try to stuff dollar bills down your front. I mean, it's this, uh, the causes, the risks for eating disorders are extremely complex. That said, in my opinion, there is a ton of of research evidence pointing to the role of sociocultural factors in creating the risk factors that in turn contribute to an increased probability of developing and maintaining an eating disorder. Absolutely. And certainly the kinds of things we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those of you who are listening who have an eating disorder or have had one, in my experience talking to hundreds of people who, who are in that position, I can't, I've never heard one say, you know what made it really easy to recover is I went back into a culture where nobody cared about my weight and shape. <laughs> exactly. Nobody commented about my body. Um, there was pretty much equal treatment of men and women. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't come across any media that was telling me I should lose weight or be afraid. I mean, come on. Exactly. I talk, I've talked on the podcast briefly about this, and I definitely talk with all my clients in private practice about this, but... I think recovery is counterculture. Our culture is not recovered. It is all about body dissatisfaction, um, the thin ideal, or more broadly, the beauty ideal, and internalizing that and also buying more stuff as a result of that. But you're like, just like you said, you're not going to go through recovery and come back out into our culture and be completely supported and embracing your body for its health and uh, just be able to set the shape and weight aside. That's just not the broader message that you're going to get. So despite that, there's a lot that you've learned through your career, being one of the top researchers in the entire field, um, about prevention. So tell us a little bit about what's important in preventing eating disorders. Well, I think the first one is there are is a lot of professional work going on now in the United States, in Great Britain, in Europe, and in Australia and in particular, trying to put some of these ideas about the risk factors for eating disorders into a set of experiences for school children and for young men and women will say grades four through um, college to put them into various programs. You could think of them as curriculum, but they're much more than curricula. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're various programs that can be called prevention as a general category. And some of the programs like the body project it, oh, they're great! Uh, are starting to have ha, are starting to have a very widespread reach, and these programs are not easily summarized on a radio podcast, but they revolve around ways of illuminating 
the internalization of the thin ideal, the fear of fat, the drive for thinness, the identification of self with weight and shape, that nervosa we talked about, Mm -hmm. trying to get people to see what this is and how it operates in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And then to understand the role of various sociocultural factors ranging from mass media to peers to uh, athletics to um, some instances family uh, and starting to think about how they as individuals can change the impact of those factors and start instituting new, more positive, uh, productive factors in their own lives. So that's one way to look at it. You can think of that as a kind of cultural literacy training, a kind of um, critical thinking about their own lives and about the culture, and a way to do it usually in a group context where people are beginning to see that what they saw before is a very private experience. This happened to me and I had this feeling. is actually happening to many, many people. Mm -hmm. And thus you're, you're making the private public, in some ways you're making the personal, the political, which is a a classic feminist message. Right. So that's one type of program. There are other types of programs that are going on that are, are trying to change the culture by trying to change broad cultural practices. For example, changing the way our culture looks at food supplements and muscle building products and the way these are marketed and the way there's no oversight for them. So there's, there's an organization in, uh, that comes out of Harvard working with p- other advocates and activists in uh, the Massachusetts area, working with the, the Massachusetts state legislature to draft legislation to provide oversight and public education about food supplements and muscle building products because there's no real oversight. Right. They can make all kinds of claims. Doesn't really do anything. They can make all kinds of claims, and they're not harmless. Nor is the attitude that maintains their use harmless. Um, There are, as you know, some attempts to change the laws that govern fashion models and who can work as a fashion model. These are health and safety laws, if you will, Mm -hmm. to try to prevent disordered eating and unhealthy practices in fashion models themselves and thus raise awareness about their lives, but also about the impact of media on us as a, as a culture or as cultures. Um, so in other words, there's, there's legislative and, and more political advocacy is at a broad level. There are also many people now starting to put together small groups, fairly small nonprofit organizations that work on helping young people males and females, to develop a more positive body image and to do it by developing new norms and ideals in their own groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's an organization called um, The Body Positive in the San Francisco area that does this kind of work. And there's an organization, I believe it's in Nebraska or Kansas, called Rebel, R-E-B-E-L, that does this sort of work. There's a lot of these kinds of organizations which are if you will, team building and social skill building and and building of advocacy and activism skills around the development of more positive body image and all that goes with that, uh, respect for others, understanding of diversity, um, tolerance and appreciation of differences, things that in in elementary school would have been called good citizenship. Mm -hmm. There's that kind of movement. There's also work that's being done um, in certain athletic contexts. The Body Project has a program for um, athletes, and some people are trying to do this sort of work with various athletic programs. Um, So there's a lot of professional work being done. Does it work, if you will, is a complicated question, but there's certainly evidence that some of these professionally developed interventions can have a very positive effect in reversing the operation of these risk factors and in reducing the number of new cases of eating disorders over at least a three-year period or so. Mm-hmm. That's now, that is a meaning, amazing. That is a culture. Yeah, but it, it's a start, and it's a, it's a good start. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
other things that, that I'm excited about, and, and I don't have any evidence that these work other than pointing toward how things have worked in other areas, I believe there's a lot that professionals can do. Yeah. Professionals like you, but also dietitians, pediatricians, trainers, uh, athletic trainers, coaches, um, that a lot of professionals can kind of look at the environment of their program, the environment of their office, the, the way that they conduct their personal, professional lives to see if their office, their practice, how they work with patients, is it contributing to this prejudice toward fat and fat people, toward this glorification of slenderness, toward the identification of women with their weight and shape or the disrespect of women and so on. I believe there's a lot that can be done at that area. Mm -hmm. That's looking at the, at the micro environments of our professional lives. And to do this by talking with the staff, by beginning to explore what are the issues here and do they affect us in our practice and how is this, and, and, and this is going to take some work, but I think it's work that's, that's very important because heavier people, particularly heavier women, even if they're not morbidly obese or even if they're not obese, heavier people, heavier women, heavier men will tell you to a person, they have no trouble telling you about the multiple ways they've been disrespected Absolutely. by various people. And that includes psychologists, by the way. Yeah. Um, and, of course, we know that if you feel disrespected by somebody or you feel unfairly criticized or you feel exploited, you're not going to listen to their advice. You're not going to come back and see them. Right. You're not going to do what they suggest to improve your health. So this is a matter of good practice, and it's a matter of first doing no harm as well. Absolutely. Um, there's also things that I think we can do in our own personal lives, lots of things we can do in our personal lives. Yeah, tell us about that, you know? because I bet a lot of people out there are listening, thinking, well, I'm not a researcher, and I'm not a psychologist or a dietitian. What, what can I do? Yeah, well, I think one thing one can do, I don't expect people to necessarily believe all the things I'm saying, but I'd like to think that I'm giving people some ideas and thoughts that they can mull over. Oh, you are. Um, you are. And not only mull them over personally, but talk to their friends and talk to their partners and talk to their uh, children or talk to their, especially adolescent children. Hey, I was listening to this guy, Levine. He was talking about this and that. Do you really think that's part of your life? You, I mean, this is a very intimate topic, as you know, as a psychologist. Uh, my students at Kenyon would talk openly in class about topics that I would have been embarrassed about. To talk. <laughs> you know, I mean, sexuality or drug use or, sure. uh, you know, uh, relationship violence among their friends. I mean, they talked openly about this in class. But you try to get them to talk about some of these topics, they just seem so personal because they have to do with your body and your hunger and your body image. And, and feeling and, and inadequate. Just so intimate. Yeah, and, and inadequacies and disparities between people and comparisons. And, and it's very personal. But it's a political act to sit down with your best friend or with your partner or, or with somebody or with your rabbi or your priest and say, this guy was talking about this. Do you think, what do you think about this? And I've had people say to me, well, I'm an eating disorders expert and I don't want to bother my friends with this stuff. Uh, you know, they, they know I do this. I, I just don't want to be late. <laughs> my but my poor really, friends definitely don't get that from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, this is really, really important. Um, and and you, want, you want to get them thinking about it and thinking about what you and your friends Let's say as a group, many people have a group of three or four close friends. They get together now and then. They go out to lunch. Maybe they play golf. Maybe they work out together. Maybe they, you can make a pact with your friends to change the, the micro environment of your friendship at the gym or your friendship on the golf course or you're going out to lunch where we're not going to talk about who's eating what. We're not going to talk about weight and shape. We're not going to talk about how so-and-so let themselves go. We're not going to gossip about that kind of stuff. Exactly. We're going to talk about substantive issues, or if we don't talk about substantive issues, we're going to talk about books we read, and we're going to talk about the authors, or we're going to talk about... It. It's not going to be about... Who's gotten thinner? Who's lost weight? Who's letting themselves go? Who's, it's, so if we can begin to change these micro units 
we can begin to make larger changes. And as you know, another thing you can do, uh, I've had people say to me, gosh, you know, how did you get started doing this sort of thing? You seem to speak very well or you have a lot of good things to say. The answer is you find places to practice and you practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, you go to your public library and if they have a, a, a lunch hour conversation time, as they often do, brown bag conversation, you volunteer to do one on this topic. Mm -hmm. Or if you are a dietitian and you live near the graduate program that you got your degree from, you go there and you give a free class or, or a lunch, brown bag lunch talk, because I can guarantee you that the average number of minutes that dietitians receive in training on these topics we've been talking about uh, this morning is less than 30 minutes. Right, right. And think this, this goes on and on. Your church group, um, if you belong to a women's business group, if you belong to the junior league, if you belong to uh, a synagogue, if you belong to a book club, if you belong to any kind of group where you might be talking about these things, you can be the facilitator of a discussion about this. And that is a political act. Right. And I found um, in my personal experience, it's been really rewarding. And people have been surprisingly open to having that discussion of what the fat is going on here. Why are why am I sitting with a group of some of my friends who are brilliant, kind, lovely women And what we're talking about is who's doing what diet and how many pounds I want to lose. Like, what the fat? What are we doing? Why why is that going on? That's so interesting. Um, Because out of all the things that we could be talking about here, that seems pretty low on the list of anything desirable to talk about. Yeah. And you can start with something simple, too. You can ask people, your friends or a group. Um, and, and there's there's ways to do this, and there are people who can give you some guidance on ways to do it. And you can always email me. My email is Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, at Kenyon.edu. Kenyon is K-E-N-Y-O-N dot E-D-U. And we'll post that you in the always, show notes, too. Yeah, you can always um, email me, and I can connect you with people. Uh, you can just ask people. Mm-hmm. Right now, in terms of how you feel or how most of your friends feel about weight and shape and their bodies and their hunger and how they take care of themselves or don't take care of themselves, you can, you can spend a bit of time trying to clarify that. Well, I know I should eat healthier food in this regard, but I don't, or I've given up on this, or, or I, I don't like exercising because the only thing I care about is how many calories I burn, and it's really annoying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can talk about those things, and then you can ask the question, how much of this do I want to pass directly on to my niece, to my daughter, to my son? Yep. How happy are you? How, how healthy are you in regard to this? And how much of it do you want to pass directly on to your daughter or son or your granddaughter? Mm-hmm. Most people are going to say, oh, gosh, I don't want them to go through what I've gone through. Right. I'm not sure how I can get out of it, or I'm not sure what to do, but I don't want to go them to go through this. And then you begin to say, well, what would it take? What kind? Of, and just the discussion alone is worth it. You may reach a point where you can, where, where you say, well, we need more information about this, or there must be somebody who's looked into this. And again, you can email me, and I can put you in touch with any number of people, and they range from reference librarians who specialize in working in these areas and helping people get the resources to uh, people who have written books on this topic, and the books are affordable. They have websites. I mean, there, there's a lot of resources now, mm-hmm. people who are part of this movement, if mm-hmm. you will. I think, too, that you can start to make little changes. I ask people now. I find an organization that's doing this kind of work, and again, you can contact me. You can contact the National Eating Disorders Association. They can. Uh, they have lists of organization. Uh, it, I ask people, you know, instead of getting me an expensive gift for my birthday that I don't need, what I'd really like is for you to donate that money to the following organization. Mm-hmm. That's a and lovely, I'll, I'll, lovely I'll gesture. Same, and, I'll, 
and I'll do the same for you. Now, that, now people will say, well, the organization I'm interested in is one that um, rescues abandoned thoroughbred horses and makes them into riding horses for kids with developmental disabilities. That's fine. Mm-hmm. The reciprocation doesn't have to be me giving to an eating disorder organization. Sure. But I, I ask people to make a donation in my name. If they want to do something that says, we, we like you, we want to wish you a happy birthday, then make a donation in my name to this particular organization. Yeah. You can f- declare for your kids that your house is a zone free of comments about weight and shape. Yeah. We had a, a, a free from teasing about fat, free from a brother's pinching sisters, uh, mm-hmm. calling them jelly butt or what, you know, and, right. that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that's, that's where, and you can say, well, in our family, we talk about these things. And the parents just don't make an autocratic statement. Some families, fine, now's the time to talk about this and what it means and for people to learn how to listen. So this may take some work, but the work, again, is part of respecting what people have to say mm-hmm. and, and, what they, and, and that this is not a, a frivolous topic. Absolutely how girls not. and women, men, um, you know, think about their weight and shape and how they feel in their bodies and whether they feel exposed and vulnerable and subject to objectification. This is not a frivolous topic uh, developed by teenage girls and expanded by magazines. This is serious business. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons why you get that phenomenon of your friend who's a neurosurgeon <laughs> and also has a master's of public health and is the president of these various organizations sitting down and saying, I think I'll be bad today and have a couple pieces of toast. Yeah, like what is that? (laughs) Yeah, as if this is a moral failing to eat bread. Right. So I don't know if I'm answering your question here, but I think that that my, my point is that there's a number of things we can do on the personal level. Mm hmm There's a number of things we can do on the professional level. And then there are also things we can do on the political level. Right. And we can't all do all of those things simultaneously. But I think if we each start doing our part at one of those levels, we'll see that in order to do that, we need to begin working on the other levels. Right. If that makes sense. So I assume, Janine, that you're, you know, you're a professional psychologist working in this area. You're also doing what you can to make changes in your own personal life and and in relationships with your friends and so on. Uh And this podcast and other things that you will go on to do, if you haven't done them already, are political. Right. I mean, one of the things in my outpatient treatment center, Colorado Therapy and Assessment Center, is that all of our clients who have any kind of eating issues, um, and sometimes beyond that too, you know, we, we operate only within the health at every size model. And we talk about these issues in therapy, that it is part of the broader context that people's eating disorders or mental health concerns are happening within. And it's really important to know that. So yes, I'm really fortunate and grateful to be able to do that on a professional level, but I'm also a person. And so when I go home or hang out with people in my life or my partner's friends and people are, you know, being really negative about their bodies, I try to really compassionately just bring up my perspective on that too. And my friends who are really close to me, we don't have any fat talk. There's a no fat talk rule. I mean, and I don't really think any of my friends, my close friends have interest in that, that they also understand the broader cultural mess that's going on with it and that they feel that they want to take that political stance too, that we just don't spend energy on that nonsense. And I mean, it took me years to, I also want to put that out there for our listeners. It's not like I suddenly became completely comfortable with my body and I always am. And I feel completely comfortable stating my opinion in every setting, but that is what I ultimately have come to do after, you know, years of working on it and working on myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that this work, as I said, it's, it's, it's self-work in, in, in many ways. And there's no end to the, the creativity that one can bring to this for those of your listeners who are creative. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you happen to be a middle school teacher, say a science teacher or social studies teacher, and, or you happen to be an aide uh, 
volunteer aid or you're in training in middle school, you can find curriculum or you can easily develop curriculum related to the health at every size paradigm. And part of that is investigating some of the myths about fat and fat people and about the value of dieting. And then you can make an assignment. And these kids, you know, that many are computer savvy and many are creative. They can develop a rap type video. They can make their own motion picture. They could develop a crossword puzzle. They could develop any number of things to then share that information with other students or with their parents or at the, at the parent-teacher night. The public libraries are often looking for things to put in the display cases. You could have the products of what the kids did there. And if you do that, you will find almost undoubtedly that this can take off in interesting ways because some of the teachers who've done things like this, one of the first things they do once the kids have a product is they contact the local newspaper or the local radio station to get those kids' pictures on the paper or get the kids on a radio program. Um, you can see how this branches out mm-hmm. and becomes, uh, in some ways, it's, it's health and science literacy. It's also media literacy. How do you get into the newspaper? Who controls newspapers? Who controls the content? How do you write a newspaper article? What's a public service announcement? Mm-hmm. All of this kind of thing is a sort of literacy that's of, of great value to many people. And, and this kind of literacy is essential to a, a democracy mm-hmm. um, and to citizenship and think things of that sort. And in some instances, the projects can be entered into statewide competitions. In other instances, you know, they can be sent to national publications that focus on the work of middle school students. And there is, yes, there is an agenda, if you will, for the health at every size. It's political in some ways, as it has to do with power and control and who controls facts and, and so but it's also science based. Yeah, it's evidence based. Um, one of the things that's often fun to do for high school students uh, is to wh- what if diets or any diet were like a drug, and that in order to begin a diet, you had to read and, let's say in this case, sign what amounts to a consent form. Oh, that's a great assignment. <laughs> that is, it says, this diet works this way. Here are the positive effects of this diet and the probability that you'll achieve them. And here are the negative effects and the probability they'll take place. And here are some of the things that you can expect if you embark on this. Do you understand these things? I mean, kids can create these kinds of uh, warning labels or warning inserts that the drug little packets that come in in a box of uh, medicine. Right. Kids can create this on a computer. Mm -hmm. And they could even send a letter to the Food and Drug Administration or send a letter to some government agency saying, how come we don't have these? Mm -hmm. This is activism. This is literacy. But it's also, you can see, very personal. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it benefits on so many levels. Yes. And if you, if you say, well, I teach writing, or I teach critical thinking, or I teach um, spelling, or I teach computer, you, oh, you can blend all these things into this activity, which has an impact or potential impact in the real world. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And our kind of the last question for today. Do you think there's hope? I do. I do too. I, I do. I do think there's hope. I don't think. Well, I, I think two things. <laughs> if I had it to do over again, I might well have not become a psychologist. I know that sounds a little odd. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, in some ways, my career has been more successful than I ever envisioned. But much of my interest now really lies in public health. Yeah, And I believe it's correct to say that in the history of medicine, there has never been a disease that was eradicated or even significantly minimized by detecting cases, even if you detected them early, and then reaching out to people who are suffering and giving them the best possible treatment. Mm -hmm. That's never happened in the history of medicine. There's no reason to expect it would happen in eating disorders. This is not to say 
that we shouldn't be expending a great deal of energy and a fair amount of money trying to raise awareness about eating disorders and the warning signs and reaching out to people who are showing those warning signs and helping them get proper treatment and helping them overcome the financial and social and cultural obstacles to getting good care. Of course we should. That's humane and that's necessary. But there'll never be enough people like you, Jeanine. Oh, thanks. They'll, I mean, there'll never be. Yeah, even if, we could have even so many all more. clinical psychologists in the United States spent half of their time mm-hmm. and knew what they were doing like you do and spent half of their time treating eating disorders, all of them, it would, it would only be a scratch on the surface of how many people are suffering. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is prevention really is the only answer right. to reducing the number of new cases, the, the so-called incidents of the disorder. Mm-hmm. We need to reduce the prevalence. Mm-hmm. But we need, but to reduce the incidence, prevention is necessary, mm-hmm. and we need to prevent eating disorders. It's not a luxury that awaits clarification of risk factors and and of of treatment methods. <laughs> right. We need to be working on this. Right. I also believe that there's hope in that if we can make these changes, it's likely to have a very positive impact on our culture. Yes. It's likely to reduce. The incidence and prevalence of, of anxiety and depression, it's likely to reduce the incidence and prevalence of the use of substances for weight management, including nicotine and other stimulants, and some of the changes that we're talking about. I don't see how our culture can't be helped in, in any way. It, it, it is not going to be helped in every way by a greater respect for, for people, regardless of size and shape, yeah. greater respect for for people regardless of gender or sexual orientation. I can't see how that's going to harm the health and well-being of our culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could only make things better. Absolutely. Yes. And so I'm I'm very hopeful. In fact, I'm more hopeful now than I was 15, 20 years ago because so many uh, accomplished people in so many countries around the world are involved in this broad prevention movement. I'm also hopeful because so many professionals in in the treatment and and mental health field and other related fields, people like you, are beginning to take this kind of of work and information very seriously. Yes. Yep. And not only seriously in terms of their one-on-one or or small group practices, but also in terms of things like podcasts like blogs, like various and sundry ways now that information can be disseminated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that there can be too much prevention, pro-health at every size, pro-recovery media out there because our media is not that way. So I think the more the better. And, and And I would encourage, if you have any listeners who are in recovery or who are recovered and they disagree with me that they think that the kind of world I'm envisioning is really going to hurt people's chances for recovery. Please email me and let me know why they think that. Yeah, it's it's hard for me uh, to I, imagine that anybody could I'm, see I'm it that way. To be open to the, I'm trying to be open to the possibility. Yeah. Well, Dr. Levine, you've been so generous with your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for being here and talking to us all about sociocultural factors and about the importance of prevention and most importantly, how we can participate in prevention um, and everybody can be involved with prevention. So in the show notes for this episode, I'm going to type up a bunch of different resources and put everything in there. So if you are listening to this and you're worried about that, don't worry. It's all going to be in the show notes, things from um, where to learn about the body project and health at every size to how you can donate to Nita by shopping on Amazon. I will put a link in there on the, uh, to, to tell you how to do that. So I will type up a bunch and then I will also, of course, put Dr. Levine's contact information in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for being here. Anytime you want to come back, we would love to have you. Oh, I would love to do so. Let's stay in touch. Okay, thanks. Thanks for joining me for another episode. Let's keep in touch. You can find all the information you need about the podcast at eatingdisorderrecoverypodcast.com, including full podcast episodes, 
and links to all of our social media sites. You can join our Facebook group for the podcast by searching Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast on Facebook. This is a closed group for listeners of the podcast looking to connect, share resources, and get involved in a pro-recovery community. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Please leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. Talk to you next time on the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. Podcast.